Sorry, Barbara, I muted you later than when you started. <laughs> Sorry. That's my sister Lil's favorite part. She loves to hear Barbara she's, she's play. She's going to start over again. Thank you, Bill. No. There we go. You didn't mute her, and then all of a sudden you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it took a little longer than it usually does. I'm sorry. You're, you're all set now. You're Go playing ahead. is my sister Lil's favorite part. She loves to hear you play, Barbara. Barbara, let us join into our call to worship this morning. And Barbara's going to help me lead this. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pray before those who worship the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before the Lord. Amen. Now, Charlotte will lead us. No, sorry. Jeff will lead us in our first hymn. Love divine, all loves excelling. Love divine, all love excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. Amen. And now, Charlotte will lead us in our congregational prayer. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, how can we love you? You have loved us by giving us your son, Jesus, to be our substitute sacrifice. We know, Lord, that we deserve to be the ones on the cross, but your love would not allow it for us. You sent your only son to die in our place, for only divinity could satisfy the just requirements of the law you gave to your people of old. In Jesus alone was your love best demonstrated to us, and in Jesus alone can we find your perfect love. For love is your very essence, O God, and love your being. Help us, O Lord, to demonstrate a love for you and our love for one another. For that is the command that Jesus left us with, to love one another as you have loved us. Strengthen us to carry out that command. Fill us with love enough to overflow to those in need around us. In the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, as we turn to a time of pastoral prayer, I would invite anybody that has a concern or a joy 
to uh, take this moment to share with us. A lot of birthdays, it seems, this week. Well, as I said earlier, my daughter's uh, 26th birthday is the fourth. Well, that's my granddaughter's, too, the fourth. How old is your granddaughter? Her name is Heather. How old is she going to be? 35. <laughs> and, and what's your oldest daughter's name? Is that Cassie? No, that's Sarah. Cassie's the youngest. Okay. She's 20. And it's Martha's birthday. Yeah, it's well, Sarah, John, and Cassie. This is John and Cassie's finals week for both of them. <laughs> so they're all stressed out. Oh, well, yeah. Anybody who's been to college knows that feeling. I'm sorry? Anyone who's been to college knows that feeling. John is your son's name? Yeah, John is uh, He's a, going to be a junior at UMaine. And Cassie's going to be a... a no, he's going to be a senior. I'm sorry. And Cassie's going to be a junior at UMass Amherst. That's what I mean. My oldest will be 52 on Cinco de Mayo. Oh. Your oldest will be what, Gail? 52 years old on Cinco de Mayo. <clears throat> How can that be? You're only 45. <laughs> I know. It's some kind of miracle. All right. Any others? Well, Julia has his finals this week, too. He's got two this week. He's been going nuts studying. He said yesterday he was spent 16 hours on a on a project. So I hope he does fine in, the, in his finals. He's looking forward to all his tests being over and then coming home next weekend. Oh, nice. That would be good. How long is he home for? Uh, I don't know, because he also has field training uh, two weeks during the summer, so where he has to go, I think, somewhere down south uh, for training. So he's going to be going back and forth. Okay. Well, at least you get to some time with him, right? <laughs> yes. My oldest granddaughter has accepted the offer of admission at St. Olaf College in Minnesota for the fall. She's very wow. excited. Oh, there is a St. Olaf, huh? There is. <laughs> yeah. Betty and, White. Uh, <laughs> the golden. Betty White, Betty White went there some years ago to visit. Back in St. Olaf. Yep. It's actually in Northfield, Minnesota. St. Olaf College. Name the literary character who attended St. Olaf's for two weeks before dropping out. Oh, King. Gonna, you'll have to share, Brian. That would be Jay Gatsby. Huh. Gatsby? Oh. Two weeks and he dropped out? Wow. Couldn't take, couldn't take the cold, I imagine. <laughs> Got tired of doing janitorial work to pay for his college. Wow. <laughs> I thought I'd share that. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. You're a fount of knowledge. Yes. That's why he's a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think we're um, we're uh, set to move on then into our pastoral prayer time. And uh, <clears throat> note that the Lord's Prayer is not in your bulletins at this time because it's part of our communion service. So hang in there for that. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day and we thank you for the sunshine and the warmth of spring. We thank you for so many birthdays, 
for oldest children and youngest children and, and for birthdays among us. We thank you for all the challenges that uh, our, our children and grandchildren are facing, including finals in school and projects completed. And we thank you that uh, you have seen fit to uh, have a, a granddaughter among us accepted into college. So we thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives and in the lives of our families. We thank you for the joy that you have set before us and for the joy that you complete within us. And Lord, we thank you for your presence, for your love, for your grace, and for your sacrifice that you made for us. So we celebrate all that you do for us, in us, and among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So now we turn to Jeff once more for the reading of the gospel, which is John 15, verses 1 through 8. The section is entitled, The Vine and the Branches. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He prunes away each and every barren branch, but the fruitful ones he trims clean to increase their yield. You are clean already, thanks to the word I have spoken to you. Live on in me as I do in you. No more than a branch can bear fruit of itself apart from the vine can you bear fruit apart from me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who lives in me and I in him will produce abundantly. For apart from me, you can do nothing. A man who does not live in me is like a withered, rejected branch, picked up to be thrown in the fire and burnt. If you live in me and my words stay part of you, you may ask what will it be that will be done for you. My father has been glorified in your bearing much fruit and becoming my disciples. May we hear in these words the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be Thank to God. God. Amen. So now let us join in a hymn, God of love and God of power. I gotta switch gears here. I'll come in at once for you, Jeff. God of love and God of power, grant us in this burning hour grace to ask these gifts of thee, daring hearts and spirits free. God of love and God of power, thou hast called us for this hour. Now as we continue on with our service and prepare for our scripture, Once again, here in the book of Acts, we see one of the early evangelists led by the Holy Spirit on a mission. He is called to go into a dangerous place on a wilderness road to become a witness for Jesus Christ to one who is mighty in a foreign land, but a practitioner of the Jewish faith who had been on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for one of the festivals. He encountered this man reading scripture for one of the, um, uh, from the book of Isaiah. 
and curious about what it might mean on a personal level for him. This gave Philip the evangelist an opening to share the good news of Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of this scripture and many others. After a baptism, the evangelist is then taken away physically by the spirit to another place so that he could spread the good news among more people. So we see the work of the Holy Spirit here in a miraculous way in the early church, enabling the spread of God's word in many places at the speed of the Spirit. So now we will hear this story from Acts 8, verses 26 through 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up, he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to that, this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that was reading, he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb, he was silent before a sharer. So he does not open his mouth. In this humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this, his generation or his life is taken away from the earth? The unit asked Philip, about whom may I ask you, does the prophet say, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. About, but Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I'm going to try again uh, to share the sermon which I pre-recorded this week. Uh, and I don't see it. <laughs> Uh, it was there a little while ago. I know. Oh my goodness, what did you uh, Hang on. I'm almost there. There it is. Pastor Dan, coming at you on this second day of May. Can you see that? A story from the Book of Acts. That's not loud enough. About an early evangelist named Philip. Here we have another example of using the Old Testament to teach about Jesus. This Ethiopian eunuch is reading the scripture written by Isaiah about 700 to 742 years or so before the time of Christ on the earth. It is from the song of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. One of the verses
verses we touched on a couple of weeks ago. The words of the servant of the Queen of Ethiopia were reading was a bit graphic. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, he was silent before its shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. What do you suppose Philip might have said about these verses as they pertain to the Christ? <coughs> Maybe the sheep reference would easily lend itself to the trial before Pilate and the denied justice to the people who called from his own nation for his crucifixion. The words from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah were perhaps even more graphic concerning the death of the Lord. In the translation, our modern translation of the book of Isaiah itself, it is perhaps more applicable to the Lord's death. For the book says in verse 8, by a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could imagine his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Justice was denied him, and a perversion of justice are similar in meaning and scope. But I think it may be more akin here to a perversion of justice than a denial of it. Maybe the version of the eunuch was reading was different from the one that Philip learned from. But certainly perversion is a denial, a twisted sense of justice that was turned on its head in the case of the trial of Jesus and his condemnation to death. Jesus did not deserve condemnation for any of the things that he was doing or did among the people. Yet the people were the ones who demanded that he be hung in the place of a murderer. I would venture to say that that was the first of the people for whom Christ died, taking on the sin of perhaps in a substitutionary way albeit undeserved, on the part of the Lord. One thing you might notice when people of Jesus' day quoted the Old Testament is that the words were not always exact as they appear in our modern translations. This is one of those places where it happens. The speakers often extract the meaning from the scriptures to emphasize a point to their modern audience, to clarify the meaning of the ancient words in light of the modern reality to which they spoke. Some would say that this is just another example of error in the text of the Bible, and therefore a reason to discount it as false in its entirety. But to explain the ancient text, there is sometimes some clarification of the ancient words just to make it easier to understand in the context of their modern reality. It is more clarification than error, more explanation than wrote. These early evangelists, remember, got their expl explanations directly from the mouth of Jesus himself. And who knows the word better than the author of it? So this is one of those places where the word of God in ancient times clearly predicted the death of the Savior. And since the death and resurrection is a present reality to those evangelists, they could extract the meaning in a way that the new convert could understand. And it says here, too, that Philip went to other scriptures 
to back up his argument with the eunuch. Of course, the text here does not extrapolate where they were. Just as this particular reading was plain to Philip in its meaning, there were others that backed up the story. Maybe others were the several servant stories in Isaiah, which also were quite plain that the Savior would have to die in a horrible way. Or maybe he turned to the story of Job, of whom God said, there is no one like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Job's was certainly a story of one who did not deserve what he was handed in life. He lost all things he had, despite his uprightness, yet kept his life and was restored. And, but it was a story of undeserved punishment such as Jesus faced in his life. Could there be some parallels there to the life of the Savior? Perhaps. Or what of Jeremiah? He was the one who cried out against Israel and Judah for their errors and rebellion. Speaking of himself, we read some similar words to the story of Christ in his punishment. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living so that his name will no longer be remembered. Isn't that the argument the priest used against the Lord in his trial in an attempt to cut him off from all the land of the living? Jesus, of course, knew that his fate was sealed, and he would be cut off from the land of the living. Jeremiah was not, at least at that time, but his prophecy was fulfilled eventually in the life and death of the Savior, Jesus Christ. But there was a purpose for the death of the Lord. That purpose, of course, was for the forgiveness of sins of all those who believed in him. And in that capacity, he was also raised from the dead and lives now forever with the Father in heaven. But he is not a figurehead. He is an active part of the Trinity of God, which is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I suspect that Philip led the eunuch through these and maybe many more scriptures to prove the death of Jesus was written about so many years before it actually happened. And more than that, to prove that he lives forever to be our intercessor with God the Father in heaven above. And he made successful presentation because the treasurer of the queen's money stopped and was baptized in that body of water by Philip before the evangelist was physically snatched away by the Holy Spirit. The conversion of the eunuch was enough for the Holy Spirit because now he himself had the knowledge to pass on the story to the folks where he lived. And Philip was free to continue his evangelism in other areas. It is no wonder that the church grew so fast in the early days after the resurrection of Jesus. It was powered by a force from heaven which pushed the boundaries of established physical property 
to accomplish the growth of the faith. It illustrated for us mere mortals that what you see is not always what you get. That there is something beyond the reality to which you are oriented that can be manipulated by the creator of all of it. After all, Jesus himself appeared to the disciples in bodily form that they recognized, but that was not subject to the reality of a closed door. And not only closed, but locked to keep out those whom the disciples feared would harm them. Yet Jesus appeared to them bodily, and he ate with them to boot. There were things going on in those days that we cannot comprehend in a way that has meaning to our understanding of the laws of physics. Maybe we need to explore more of that reality to account for what was described in the Bible. Or maybe we just need to exercise our faith. God used things beyond our understanding, beyond our sense of the natural, to spread the good news. We would call it supernatural because it is beyond the natural. And I think we have discounted the ability of God to work in that way today. We see the era of the Acts of the Apostles as something that happened in the past and is no longer applicable to the present. Those kinds of things no longer happen, we say. God did some miraculous work in the early days after the resurrection that can't or won't happen today because the work is done. The church has grown. The people of God already know that Jesus died and rose and ascended, and the word has gone throughout the whole world. Everybody knows about Jesus and all the things that happened with him in those days. The good news has been proclaimed, and God doesn't need to operate in the supernatural anymore to bring the good news about Jesus to the world. But is that really true? What of the declining numbers of people that go to church? or the even fewer people that profess Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The Christian church is declining, and other churches are increasing. Have we come to take the supernatural events as historical only? Have we discounted the power of God to work in our day? Maybe we need to bring back a belief in the power of God to work in ways we don't understand, to breathe life into the church today. We in the church are becoming more and more irrelevant in the society in which we live because we practice the form of religion without the power. The good news is that Jesus still lives and still works in supernatural ways to bring about his purposes on the earth. Can we believe? I think we must. Amen. And amen. Amen. So now we enter into our time of communion. So I invite you, and Christ the Lord invites to his table all who love him.
who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another, saying, Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us all bring our own confessions before the Lord. Amen. So now, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. Now let us pass as we can on Zoom our peace to one another. God bless you. God peace. be with you. Peace. God's peace and God's love. Peace with you all. Thank you. Now as forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God as we enter into the time of Thanksgiving. So the Lord be with you. Also with, also with you. Lift up your hearts. We, lift them, we up. lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God, God of power Lord, and might, heaven and, and earth, earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the, the highest. Blessed, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in, the in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. 
Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. So pour out for your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, as Barbara leads us with some music, take the body of Christ given for you. Receive the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. Amen. Let us join in our final hymn now. <coughs> oh, make of all disciples, since we received the body and the blood of Christ, our job now is to go out into that wide world to make of all disciples. Join in our congregational prayer for renewal, which will be led by Gail. Where's Gail? Did she hear you? I think Gail, yeah. Yeah, uh, Gail, can you unmute? How about now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> Thank you. O God of power in the natural and power beyond our understanding, give us faith to believe in your ability to work in ways that we do not understand. <coughs> give us grace to lean into your love and the strength to embrace your miraculous power. You have given us your Holy Spirit to fulfill your purposes through us. Help us to connect to that power within us 
in a way that is a witness to the world around us. For we are your people. We are your servants in the world, servants of the most high God through Jesus, your son. Thank you, O Lord, in the name of Jesus, who died and rose again, and in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now may the love of God, the grace of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. you all. Barbara, did you Thank hear you what I coming. said before? Did no. you hear what I said before about my sister Lil? No. She absolutely loves to hear you play. Oh. Because okay. she listens to this every Sunday. Oh, I didn't hear you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Have a fantastic week, everybody. Yeah, you have too. a great week. <laughs>